I want to welcome folks who have already tuned in. Um, I'll probably give it two more minutes um, and then get started. All right, everybody, I want to thank those of you who have already joined this Crow Canyon webinar. Uh, people are still joining, but I'm going to go ahead and get started with the introduction. My name is Mark Varian, and I'm the Executive Vice President of the Research Institute at Crow Canyon. Um, tonight's talk is titled An Embarrassment of Riches, Large Tree Ring Data Sets and the Reconstruction of Pre-Columbian History in the Southwest, and it's by Dr. Steve Nash. We want to thank those that make this webinar possible, especially two of our Crow Canyon uh, staff members who handle the technical and logistical side of these webinars. That's Dylan Schwint and especially Taylor Hasbrook, who's running it behind the scenes tonight. We also want to thank our funders, which has been provided by the Colorado Humanities and National Endowment for Humanities as part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, or CARES Act, an economic stabilization plan of 2020. So uh, everybody's becoming a pro at Zoom. If, uh, if it is your first time, I wanna tell you that you can minimize the size of the talking heads and move them up into the corner of your screen. And um, that way, when Steve starts his presentation, that won't be blocking out his presentation. We encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A button that will probably be at the bottom of your screen. And we will track those questions. We'll probably ask Steve most of them at the end of the talk. Um, and we'll try to get to all of them, but if we don't, we'll try and get to them in another manner after the talk. If you're having any difficulties uh, streaming over Zoom, you can also go to Crow Canyon's Facebook page at that address that you see there, facebook.com backslash Crow Canyon Archaeological Center, and get on the webinar from that venue. Finally, you should sub subscribe to Crow Canyon's YouTube page because we publish all of our webinars, which we've been doing every Thursday uh, on that YouTube page. You can review this one if you have to leave early or if there's part of it you wanna review again, find a slide with information that you uh, wanna see again. Um, it's real easy to find, it's at that address, crowcanyon.org backslash YouTube. Um, I hope that most of you know about the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. Some of you may not. We're located just outside of Cortez, Colorado, in the southwestern corner of the state. And our mission is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. That's a picture of the center of our campus uh, with the beautiful Sleeping Ute Mountain in the background, which is the the Ute Mountain Ute Nation's lands. Oops. The Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo Ute and Diné people on whose traditional homelands we work and reside. We're very grateful to all indigenous people who continue to preserve and protect cultural traditions, maintain ancestral relationships, and steward these lands. I want to encourage you to tune in to the next two uh, webinars that will be in the uh, on successive Thursdays. Uh, next Thursday, uh, it will be co-sponsored by the Pueblo Archaeological and Historical Society, and it will be the Archaeology of Rock Art by Dr. Lawrence Lowendorf, one of the premier 
perhaps the premier rock art uh, archaeologist working in the West and, and probably beyond. I know his work mostly in the West. Um, that'll be Thursday, November 5th. All of these are at 4 p.m. Then the next Thursday is Pioge, a classic period Tewa community in New Mexico by Patrick Cruz, who is uh, either just finishing or has already finished his degree, graduate degree at the University of Colorado Boulder. And Patrick is from uh, the Tewa Pueblo of Okeawinge. Um, so that will be a really excellent and wonderful talk by a up and coming indigenous archeologist. This slide gives you the name of funds that you can go to if you want to support native communities during the pandemic. Um, you can write down those, uh, those uh, web addresses. And this is, a, this is a good reason to put this on the YouTube channel because if you don't have something to write with now and you don't catch them, you can go get this talk on the YouTube channel, find this slide and find these, uh, find these um, groups that are working to help uh, Native communities during this uh, difficult time. So please check that out because it makes a difference. That brings us back to our tonight, our uh, webinar tonight, An Embarrassment of Riches, Large Tree Ring Datasets and the Reconstruction of Pre-Columbian History in the Southwest by Dr. Steve Nash. Steve is the Director of, Anth of Anthropology and Senior Curator of Archaeology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. He's an archaeologist, columnist, historian of science, and a stand-up comedian. He is currently studying the Mugion archaeology of southwestern New Mexico. He's studying Indian peace medals in the Crane Collection at DMNS and the enchanted uh, Russian gem carving sculptures of Vasily Konovalenko. He has written and edited seven books and dozens of peer-reviewed articles on subjects ranging from Neanderthal stone tools to tree ring dates and on the history of museums in southwestern archaeology. He's published nearly 40 curiosities, curiosities columns in sapiens.org. And if you haven't checked out sapiens.org, you could, you should. It's one, it's becoming one of the preeminent voices for anthropology and social science for the public. Uh, it's really excellent. And Steve has published on topics ranging from ancient Roman hygiene to Leonardo da Vinci and from the Huey helicopter to the modern use of GPS systems. He's been at DMNS for the last 13 years. Prior to that, he served as the head of collections in the Department of Anthropology at the Field Museum in Chicago. Eons ago, he served as a tour guide and lecturer at the Museum of Science and History. Steve, we're so excited for your talk. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you. Cool. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your busy day um, to, to join us and to talk about tree ring dating and to talk about one of my favorite parts of the world and favorite institutions, and that is southwestern Colorado uh, and the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. Um, as you can tell from the introduction that Mark gave, um, I'm not very good at diving deep in many subjects. I, my curiosity extends far and wide. And one of the joys of working as a museum curator is that I can um, dabble in a whole series of topics and try and find interesting and weird connections between them. Because what I've found is that lots of people have interest in the archaeology that, that we get to do, that we're privileged to do. Um, but not many people have the time to dive into them as deeply as, as we do. And I think we have a responsibility of taking the data that we generate, the fascinating, excellent, great, unparalleled data that we generate, particularly in the American Southwest, and making that information accessible to members of the general public. But then, as Crow Canyon has done so well, also make sure that that scientific archaeological knowledge is working in conjunction with American Indian uh, knowledge, um, uh, and, and indigenous ways of understanding the landscape and time and so on and so forth. Now, that being said, one of my great loves in this world is tree ring dating. Um, tree ring dates are the best chronometric data, archaeological dates that we can get um, anywhere in the world. Uh, when they're done, when, when, when you're lucky and when they're done properly, you get a calendar year date and you can even sometimes get a seasonal date. So you can say this tree was cut in late uh, summer of the year 866, for instance. That is a phenomenal thing 
a phenomenal statement, a phenomenal science that we sometimes take for granted. We have to be careful in how we use tree ring dates and what we do with them. So I'm going to spend time thinking about that with you all today. Um, and there's also misconceptions about archaeological dating in general. So, so the two things I need to do today, we got to go back to, to archaeology 101 and go into tree ring dating 101 and discuss the, the, the how tree ring dating is done and what kind of data it generates. From there, we're going to look at some very large tree ring data sets and try and understand what we can make out of the patterns that we see in these, in these large data sets. Now, I will be the first one to admit that different scientists, different scholars bring different biases and proclivities and interests to the same data sets. And this is what's been really cool to watch is that some people, some colleagues, friends at Crow Canyon and elsewhere have been doing one thing with these data sets. I've been looking at, at them a different way. And the truth is going to be somewhere in, in between. So what I'm offering here is not uh, criticism. It is critique. And that's how science proceeds is that you go back and forth on some of these issues. So just to, to, as, a, as a reminder, for those of you who aren't familiar with Colorado, the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center has had two major research projects going in the last several decades. The first was the Village Ecodynamics Project 1, and that was in a study area up in the northwest, uh, upper left, the northwest corner of this map. Um, but Mark came to me in 2007 or 8 uh, saying that they had gotten National Science Foundation funding to do the Village Ecodynamics 2 project, a follow-up looking at how people in the ancient Southwest in these two particular regions uh, made it, how they lived, how they, how they um, survived, how they thrived, all of that kind of thing. And because I had a background in tree ring dating, Mark asked me to take a tree ring database that he had, a large tree ring database, uh, and to clean it up and update it and, and see what I could do with it. And because I study the history of archaeology, my dissertation was on the history of tree ring dating, as we'll see. Um, I looked at this big data set from a historical perspective, and that's what I want to share with you. So I don't want to go too deeply into this map, um, but you can see there, there's two regions that I'm going to be talking about in these squares. There's this northwest region, which is right around Crow Canyon there in Cortez, Colorado. It includes canyons of the Ancients National Monument, Sleeping Ute Mountain, Mesa Verde National Park. Uh, archaeological sites around the Dolores River and so on. And then the big rectangle down in the lower right, which is the upper Rio Grande River basin area, which includes Santa Fe and, and uh, Los Alamos, Bandelier National Monument, much of the Jemez Mountains and so on. These, I should say, are two of the best understood, I think I can make that statement, archaeological regions in the world. The data are absolutely spectacular. So where in other parts of the world, when you're talking about archaeological dates, you hope to get a plus or minus on a date of 100 years. And we've got the best data there through tree ring dating. So the trick is, what do we make of those tree ring dates? How do we make of them? So here is a distribution, a very simple distribution of 19,233 tree ring dates from this database that we compiled from the Four Corners and Rio Grande regions. And I ask you to look at this. The number of dates is over there on the, on the y-axis. The outside date for these tree ring dates, so the, the, the last date for the tree ring specimen is there on the bottom. They're binned by decade. So each one of those bars that you see um, represents the number of tree ring dates from that decade. So, for instance, the highest peak there is the 1230s. It's the decade of the 1230s. And there's, we have 1,600 good tree ring dates from the 1230s. What does that mean? What does it mean to have 1,600 dates? Many people would be jealous to have that many dates. We're, it's an embarrassment of riches because we have this information, we have these data, but the trick is that we have to be careful, I think, with what we say these things mean. The other thing that you'll see in this is that we don't. there are a few dates before 400 and a few after 1,600 that I took off, but I bounded it from the year 400 to the year 1,600, and you can see some oscillations in that curve. And the question is, what do those oscillations mean? What do the big peaks, say, around the 600s to the 700s mean versus the trough in the early 700s? What does the peak in the 800s mean versus the trough in the early 900s and so on? What does this curve mean? So we're going to spend some time today deconstructing this curve, and I'm going to tell you why. I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but why I think we need to proceed with caution when interpreting big tree ring date distributions like this. Okay? So now I'm going to get specific. And if Mike Berry and Larry Benson are on this call, good afternoon, gentlemen. And I offer this in the spirit of, of 
scholarly communication and so on. But Mike and, and, and Larry published an article in this edited volume that Crow Canyon, Mark did, uh, and Crow Canyon did some years ago. And, and Mike Berry and Larry Benson wrote the following, quote, there is no reason to suspect intentional systemic bias in the original tree ring record. That is, there's no reason to suspect intentional systemic bias in this date distribution. Now, it begs the question what intentional means in this situation, but let's just say suspect systemic bias, okay? Rather than accept that statement as a, as a true truism, I said, let's test that as a hypothesis. They also wrote, the very large sample size lends confidence to the representativeness of the tree ring date distributions. Again, all of us went, well, many of us took statistics and you know, what's a big sample size? Certainly 19,000 tree ring dates seems like a pretty good sample size, but you never know until you look, right? Some years later, Kyle Basinski and his co-authors, and Kyle, if you're on the call, same, same caveats, I love what you do and thank you for doing it, uh, but I'm gonna offer a, 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 a deconstruction of some of this. And Kyle and his colleagues wrote, potential sampling biases still exist because of uneven preservation and investigation. So they accepted that potential sampling biases exist in that tree ring date distribution. But they went on to say the size of our database and the robustness of the patterns identified by Barry back in 1982, but also in 2010, are reassuring. So they did what archaeologists should do. You work with the data that you have, you proceed, you analyze, uh, and they published this really sophisticated analysis of what those peaks and valleys mean. Totally fine, right? but I wanna look at it from the perspective of the history of tree ring dating in this region. Now, what we have to do is take a step back and think about what tree ring dating is. Tree ring dating quite literally is the study of tree time. That's what the word means, the study of tree time. It is not ring counting, and I'll show you an illustration of this later, um, but you cannot go to a tree and count the rings on it and say it's a such and such an age. You can, all school kids do, but in order to do archaeological tree ring dating, it is more complicated, more sophisticated, and therefore um, uh, we don't, we can't provide as many dates as we could if you just went up to any old tree and counted things. <clears throat> tree ring samples, like the one I'm holding here in my hand, can provide you. I always have to remember which way the camera goes, but there it is. That tree ring sample, beautiful piece of wood from Zuni Pueblo, can provide us with three different types of, of information. Chronometric, we can get dates for the rings on here, as we'll see. We can get climatological information because in the American Southwest, typically speaking, a wide ring is produced during a wet year, a narrow ring is produced during a dry year. So you can reconstruct precipitation by seeing when, the, when it was wet and dry and wet and dry and so on. We can also get behavioral information out of, out of these samples. And this thing is you know, squared off here. This is milled lumber. And so just by looking at it without analyzing any of the tree rings on it, we can say that this piece of wood post dates 1884 because there was no milled lumber at Zuni Pueblo until after the railroad arrived in 1884. Okay, three different types of information, dates, um, environmental stuff, and then behavioral stuff we can get from these things. And we're going to be talking about at least the dates and the behavioral aspects of this as we go on. Today, um, dendrochronology tree ring dating is used in, a, in, a, in an exceedingly wide range of studies from architectural analysis, particularly in Europe, to history, um, climatology, ecology, fire history. It is an absolutely amazing science. And I, don't, I honestly can't think of any other technique that is so um, widely applied in so many differences and so, so many disciplines and in so many different rate, ways. It is an absolutely fascinating science that developed right here in the American Southwest um, and uh, where it remains uh, a premier laboratory for, for tree ring dating. So the key contributions that tree ring dates can give us, of course, for us, it gave us the age of the archaeological ruins. This is hard to imagine now for us, but 100 years ago, archaeologists working in the American Southwest literally had no understanding, no good guess on how old the sites at Mesa Verde or Chaco Canyon really were. They guessed but they guessed way too old. They thought that the sites at Mesa Verde were 2,000 years old. In fact, they're only about 1,000 years old, the cliff dwellings. Um, they thought that you know, basket maker sites were 4,000 years old when in fact they're only 2,000 years old. They were hoping for ancientness. And when tree ring dating gave them dates on these ruins, Alfred Vincent Kidder, the grandfather of archeology span said, oh geez, tree ring dating keeps dragging these things away from our cherished BCs. 
He was disappointed with the dates that he was getting. He wasn't happy that he was actually getting dates. He was disappointed that they weren't fitting with his preconceived notions, which is fascinating. Tree ring dating is also used to date the oldest living things, which are the bristle cones, pines in the Sierra Nevada, California, um, Nevada, Utah, elsewhere. Um, it can, of course, help us understand climate change, global warming. And what's particularly germane to us right now is forest fire frequency. And, and I've got one more slide about this in a few minutes, uh, but we need to talk about that because Colorado is an inferno right now. Two of the state's largest wildfires are happening right now, and tree ring dating can help us understand what's going on there. All right, tree ring dating. It's a study of tree time. There are four prerequisites that have to be satisfied for tree ring dating to be performed. There are two more that have to be satisfied for archaeological dating to be possible. The, the key principles of tree ring dating are the principle of cross dating, which we'll talk about. The principle of replication we won't talk about so much, but it's basically you need to have large sample sizes. You need lots and lots of tree ring samples in order to, to be able to do this. And then you have to build chronologies, tree ring chronologies from the current era going back in time. And then you've got a reference chronology against which you can then date the newly discovered samples. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But let's talk about the prerequisites for just a minute. So the prerequisites for dendrochronology, you have to have trees that grow one growth ring per year. And that's a distinct growth ring. Tree ring dating doesn't work well in the tropics because trees either grow continuously or they just don't grow in growth rings, these alternating bands of light and dark wood. Um, Tree ring dating does work well in temperate and arid parts of the world uh, because trees have a cessation of growth. They stop growing at one point. So they're growing for six months a year and then they stop growing for the next six months. That's great for us as scientists. Ideally, the growth has to be limited by one factor. In the American Southwest, it's usually precipitation. And that's what causes the alternating uh, wide and narrow rings that allow us to cross date. In upper elevations, it's temperature. In other places, it's it's different climate factors, but you want the growth typically limited by one factor that you can then isolate mathematically in the analysis that you're doing. That factor also has to have annual variability. So in the Southwest, these trees get a lot of um, rain in the, during the monsoon. They're also affected by snowpack sometimes, uh, but it's annual variability that is then traceable and recordable and so on. And then there's also gotta be regional continuity. And one of the fascinating things about tree rings in, say, Cortez, Colorado, or near there in the San Juan Mountains, they have some of the same precipitation signal that is present in the redwoods and the sequoias in California. The precipitation regimes are similar enough in those two radically different environments that the trees that you can you can at times cross date the trees in those two different regions, um, and and that's remarkable. So there's regional continuity in the signals that we are then trying to reconstruct. So. Tree ring dating is not ring counting. It doesn't work everywhere, and it's, it works under very, very specific conditions. Now, to use tree rings, to use wood or charcoal to date archaeological sites, the people who made those sites had to use datable species. So um, pinyon pine, juniper work okay in the southwest. The best ones are, for our purposes, are ponderosa pine and Douglas fir. If we've got sites in which there are beams, like at Mesa Verde, that are made out of Douglas fir and ponderosa pine, we're sitting in tree ring dating heaven. There's a, a, a Pueblo room in the Mogollon region down there in the lower right that has charcoal preserved in it. That is Douglas fir charcoal as well. We can do tree ring dating on charcoal. But if those people didn't use um, datable species, they could leave all the wood they wanted to behind and we wouldn't be able to date it. So the wood and the charcoal has to be preserved, has to be used, has to be preserved. And Archaeologists have to do research on this, those sites where that stuff is preserved. And this is a key thing that we're going to see in the, in the date distribution analysis here in a little bit. The principle of cross dating. I said that it's the tree ring dating is not ring counting. What is it then? It's the procedure of matching ring width variations among trees that have grown in nearby areas, allowing the identification of the exact year in which each ring formed. It's pattern matching. Essentially, tree ring dating is pattern matching. And what you can see in the little graphic there on the lower right is working people working their way back from living trees to ancient trees to archaeological sites, matching the patterns in the tree ring specimens that they find. And then once you have that chronology established, when you get a new sample, you bring that in, look at the rings, and then match the, the rings on your new sample, sample to the chronology that you've established. It's mind-numbingly dull work. I got to tell you, I can't do the work myself. I love the, 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 
the data that we generate and all that, the results and all that kind of stuff. But my goodness, being a dental chronologist is, a, is another talent entirely. Now, there are problems in some years in the American Southwest, in many years in the American Southwest, trees will fail to grow at all. And so there will be a missing ring for a given year. And then all of a sudden you're, you're looking at this sequence, this pattern, and it's off by a year or two or three. And so you have to account for those missing years. By the same token, a severe cold snap that comes in in, say, May or June, and we get these things fairly frequently, can tell the tree, uh-oh, it's fall, I got to shut down growth, and they shut down growth, and then all of a sudden in mid-June, it gets warm again, and they start growing again, and then you end up with what's called a, a, a double ring, and that can mean that your patterns are off. So people who do tree ring dating spend a lot of time looking at samples and getting to know the growth patterns in these areas so well that it ends up being um, an intuitive process, not just a, a quantitative process. And Andrew Ellicott Douglas, the founder of tree ring dating, was criticized in the 1930s because he didn't have a quantitative technique to do this. He felt he didn't need it. And his critics said, why don't you measure, you know, you can do this quantitative stuff. Why don't you do that? And he did a little bit, but he was trying to make a point. And he said, when you walk into a room full of friends do you measure their faces in order to recognize them? No, of course you don't. It's not a quantitative thing. It's a qualitative thing. And the tree ring folks that do this work get to know these ring patterns so well that very much of it is in their head. Now, they, they add quantitative measurements and things to that process now, but um, it's really a remarkable thing to see. So here's an illustration, um, and there are people in this world who could look at these little tree ring cores. So I've got a core in my hand. Um, and you can see that this is just, it's a pencil thin core that was taken out of a living tree. It doesn't kill the tree. You can see the bark on the end there by my finger. And this is a, a mounted tree ring core that you can do analysis on. It's just like the ones on the screen, but good dendrochronologists could look at this and date it, just do it, doing it visually. But I've given you a visual um, here so you can understand what we're talking about. On each one of these tree ring specimens, I've pointed to the year 1793, which is well known across the Southwest for having a wide ring with thick late wood. The late wood is the, bark, the dark band in that ring. It was a good year for trees. They went gangbusters. And it's a marker year that people can spot. When, they, when they're doing this, they see it, they just go boom. 1806, on the other hand, was an, a bad year for precipitation in the Southwest. So it's a narrow ring in many cases. It's totally missing in the in this in the ring i mean in the core at the bottom and so they've had to account for that that little hole there is a signal to the person who's doing the measuring that there's a missing ring there and then another one 1816 the year after krakatoa blew up in indonesia the world is coated in in clouds and it leads to more precipitation in the southwest so again the trees go gangbusters so the point here is not the, that the rings are exactly the same size it's that the patterns in each one of these cores is the same now, archaeologically, trees can give us, when we can date a specimen, it gives us a couple of things. It, ideally, it gives us a cutting date, which is the date of a tree's death, and it's easier to interpret because, boom, that's when the tree died. So this photograph that I've got here, you'll see the year 550 is pointed out on that specimen. This is a really old tree. Add up, I mean, uh, however many other rings, I don't know the exact date for the outside of this thing, but there's say there's 100 rings on there. The outer date, the cutting date would be 650 because we've got bark and other indications that that is the last ring grown, grown on the tree when it died. Um, so cutting dates are what we want. Cut non-cutting dates, the date on the last date, the last ring on the specimen is not the last one grown by the tree, and it's harder to interpret. So the specimen I showed you earlier, this is going to yield a non-cutting date because we don't know how many rings are missing from the outside of the specimen. So just to illustrate that on the slides, I put a rectangle on there. And you can see X number of, of rings are missing from the outside. So from an interpretive perspective, what we want to be dealing with is cutting dates, not non-cutting dates. But you use what you can. In the interest of time, I'm going to blow through two case studies. Um, I do want to talk about the fire history aspect of this. Um, you can see the sample there. It has a fire scar on it. This tree was hurt but not killed by a fire. That is a classic fire scar on this specimen. Some of the trees in the American West we can find with 30 scars, fire scars. Fire was a part of these ecosystems out here. Tree ring dating has demonstrated fire is a natural part of these ecosystems. And our policy of putting out fires, you know, the 8 by 10, uh, seen by 8, out by 10, or just squash all forest fires is not good for the health of the forests. They're not in equilibrium. 
and they are getting worse. Um, but there's lots of good tree ring work on this. That's my last little bit of preaching and proselytizing. But tree rings do a lot of good for the study of fire history in this world. All right. There's our old friend, folks. We know what tree ring dates are. Um, this is the, the graph of all of the cutting dates from the two regions that we talked about. We are going to take out the non-cutting dates because they're interpretively problematic, but we're going to deconstruct this curve and try and figure out what it means first for Mesa Verde and then for the region around Mesa Verde and then very quickly for the Rio Grande Pueblos. I, I'm publishing all of this in, another, um, in, a, in an article here. Um, and I can give you more details, but we're going to do the deep dive on the Mesa Verde situation, and then we'll go into the the, uh, the other two very, very quickly. There's Mesa Verde back in the day, back when it uh, was not ADA compliant, let's just say. Uh, one of the world's premier archaeological sites. Absolutely fascinating. It is a laboratory for archaeology. There's 4,500 documented sites in that park, and the park has only been half surveyed, roughly. Um, it's a laboratory for tree ring dating because we have 4,400 tree ring dates from 143 sites at Mesa Verde National Park. And that's glorious, folks. But if you divide 143 by 4,500, uh, let me come back. Um, the, but the, the boundaries of Mesa Verde National Park are, are arbitrary, as we'll see in just a second. So I'll come back to that. But if you do the math, 143 sites divided by 4,500 documented sites it means that only 3% of all the sites in the park are dated. And even with the cliff dwellings, which are in some cases, I mean, we'd have to argue they're well dated. Only one in four of the cliff dwelling sites has tree ring dates from it. So it's not, it's an embarrassment of riches. It's, it, it's a fantastic situation, but it's not as good as sometimes we take for granted. Here's the map of, of Mesa Verde National Park. And this is where I, I point out that Mesa Verde National Park, the boundaries of it are archeologically arbitrary. The, the park only covers, what, a half of the Mesa Verde landform, and then it's surrounded by Ute Mountain Ute Reservation, um, which has scarcely been examined at all, and there are cliff dwellings and sites all through the reservation. The archaeology doesn't stop at those boundaries, and this is good. We'll come back to that point. We'll come back to us here in a few minutes. So um, this is what the Mesa Verde um, cutting date dis distribution looked like when I finished the database for Mark and Crow Canyon back in 2012. And as an archaeologist, you look at this and you say, all right, that looks roughly like the story that we tell ourselves about Mesa Verde, about the occupation of Mesa Verde National Park. Almost no cutting dates before AD 600. You've got a peak of several hundred um, tree ring dates from, clip, from um, pit house sites in, that, um, uh, in the 600s. And then you've got some troughs there. And then you've got a peak in the 800s. Then you've got some troughs down there and then boom, things go bonkers at 1200 and then they really go bonkers in the mid 1200s. That's the, when the cliff dwellings are built. That's the story that makes sense. An archaeologist would look at this and say, yep, <clears throat> that's what was happening in Mesa Verde. What I want to do is, <clears throat> excuse me, is go back in history and look at how this date distribution curve for Mesa Verde specifically was derived. Tree ring dating developed in 1929. It was applied, it first was published in 1929. At Mesa Verde, in 1929, we had six dated sites, six cliff dwellings that had one or two tree ring dates from them, and we had a total of 12 dates. That's not really enough to make any sense out of what's going on behaviorally at Mesa Verde National Park. In 1951, the number of dated sites went up to 26. The number of dates uh, increased by an order of magnitude to 136. By 1974, the number of sites tripled and the number of dated sites, I mean, the number of dates that we had increased by an order of magnitude again. Between 74 and 90, not much happened. There wasn't a lot of research happening at, at Mesa Verde. And then by 2012, we had 143 dated sites and 4,300 dates. So let's look at what the tree ring date distribution would have looked like when we graph these dates in 1929, 51, 74. We're not going to look at 29. There's not enough. 51, 74, and 2012. And let's ask ourselves, what is the story that archaeologists would tell based on the date distribution curve that we're going to see? Here is the date distribution curve for 1951. You remember there were 26 sites and 136 dates or something like that. We graph them, bend by decade. This is what we get. The 600s and the 800s, remember those two peaks in the distribution? Those aren't even present because nobody had been collecting tree ring dates from pit house sites at Mesa Verde. 
They're just not even on this distribution. They don't exist. So we've got a little peak in the late 800s and then in thousands. And then we've got the biggest peak in the cliff dwelling period. Eh, that looks all right. That looks like the story that we tell ourselves, right? 1974, oh, sorry. And these, these groups, these clusters, I'm sorry, the, the cluster in the 900s really is only from one site, the Farview group number 12. And the cluster, the biggest cluster over there on the right is from Cliff Palace. So on one hand, this is telling the story of Mesa Verde. On the other hand, doing a deep dive into the database, these sites are really come, these dates are really coming from only two sites. How representative are they? You tell me. Okay, so here's the date distribution in 1974. You remember the total number of dates has gone up by an order of magnitude. I superimposed the, the line for that Cliff Palace peak in 1951 on here so that you can get an idea of how this thing has changed in the 24, 23 years between 51 and 74. And what you see still there, the, the 600 and the 700 peaks are in there now. Why? Because in the 1960s, the late 50s and 60s, the park engaged in the Wetherill Mesa Archaeological Project, which was designed to open a different mesa top to visitation by tourists. And in that project, they excavated a lot of pit house sites that are up on the mesa top. So instead of just doing the cliff dwellings, which are down in the canyons, they were preparing the mesa tops for visitation. So they dug a lot of pit house sites, they got a lot of charcoal, and they got a lot of ancient dates. Look at this peak in the, in the 800s, in the mid 800s. This is saying the most intense occupation of Mesa Verde. If you equate tree ring dates with occupation, this will tell you that, that, that the most intense occupation of Mesa Verde National Park is in the 800s. That doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense based on what we know about the archaeology. And then you look in the late 1200s and things haven't changed very much at all. There's some, some um, dates added in the uh, 1240s. Um, and, uh, you know, and so, but the point being, this general distribution looks and feels different from what we know. And it's a function of the history of archaeological research at Mesa Verde National Park, which was not designed to get a sample of every ecotone, every site, every everything. It was done based on developing Mesa Verde for tourism, not an archaeological question. It's a logistical question. Um, and if we dive deep into the history, what we see is that the peak in the 600s, again, is from the Wetherill Mesa Archaeological Project. That peak in the 730s, that peak of 30 dates, that comes from Bob Lister at the University of Colorado. His field school dug a single site down there. Those dates all come from one site. How representative is it from of Mesa Verde? Who knows? This peak, the biggest peak in this distribution, is from the excavation of only three pit houses, not three sites, three pit houses and one kiva. These are exceedingly well-dated um, structures, not even sites. How representative are they? We don't know. And then the peak at the, in, the, um, in the 1200s is simply from a detailed investigation of Spruce Tree House. All right, what does it look like in 2012? Well, in 1990 uh, and since 1990, the park and the tree ring lab and others have been interested in doing 100% sampling projects on the cliff dwellings to go and get every datable piece of wood that there is. Have they gone and tried to get every datable piece of wood from pit house sites? No. Every, every datable piece of charcoal from the pit house sites? Absolutely not. So just by their interest in dating all the wood from the, from the cliff dwellings, we get a major peak at the end of this distribution. Again, it looks, it feels like the story that archaeologists tell ourselves is happening at Mesa Verde. But I would argue it is demonstrably a function of development processes uh, for tourism at, at, um, at Mesa Verde and decisions that archaeologists made about where to dig and where to collect samples. And it's less about the pre-Columbian history of what happened at that park. Again, diving deep into the contextual information that's in the database, the big, the big peak there in the early part is from Step House Cave, a pit house. Again, there's our three pit houses and one great kiva, but they're dwarfed by that 100% sampling project. So I ask you, which is the real date distribution for Mesa Verde National Park? Is it the one in 1951? Clearly not, sample was too small. Is it the one from 1974? Clearly not, because we know that uh, through, through other archeological analyses that pit house sites were not the peak of occupation at Mesa Verde National Park. Is it this one from 2012? Is it this one uh, that is most recent? It would be hubristic of us to say that this is gonna be the date distribution going forward. It will change and we have to be careful when we interpret it. So take a breath here, digest. 
And let's look at the Four Corners region outside of Mesa Verde. Mesa Verde is unique. It's a federal entity that it has had systematic archaeology done on it for a very long time. In the Four Corners region where Crow Canyon has been working for so long, Crow Canyon Archaeological Center is the entity which has formed a thread through the archaeological research through this part of the world for decades now. And that's fantastic. So we have 9,541 uh, total dates. Crow Canyon is responsible for getting 20% of those dates in the database. Um, and seven of the sites that, they, that Crow Canyon excavated, Castle Rock Pueblo, Duckfoot Sites, Sticks and Leaves Pueblo, Shields Pueblo, and others, are responsible for the vast majority of those tree ring dates. So it's up to Mark to tell us how representative those sites are of the archaeology of the region. Um, but just to use San Canyon Pueblo as an example, uh, which I don't have on the list, but San Canyon Pueblo has, I think, 748 tree ring dates available from it. Does that sound right, Mark? Nod. I'm not sure if I'm muted or not, but that sounds uh, correct. Yeah, so 748 tree ring dates from San Canyon Pueblo. Um, that's only, you guys only excavated about 10% of the site, correct? It's a huge yeah, site. Yeah, maybe a little less than that. Right. Um, also, Steve, just for future presentations, uh, Sticks and Leaves is actually a, an excavation by Bruce Bradley and not oh. Crow Canyon. Okay, my bad. All right, thank you, Bruce. Bruce. Thank you, Mark. So we've got 750 tree ring dates from, from San Canyon Pueblo. Anybody would agree that that's a robust data set, right? But if it's from less than 10% of the Pueblo, how robust is it? And then if you look at the subsite provenience, the contextual information from where those uh, tree ring dates came from, more than 30% of them came from the excavation of only three kivas, right? Three kivas. So, so we've got one well-dated site and three exceedingly well-dated kivas from that site. And the question is, how representative are they of the archaeology of the region? If we're going to use the tree ring date distribution for the region to make arguments about what was happening in, in prehistory. So just to, to very quickly summarize on this, if you're going to use these big data for this part of the world, you better talk to Crow Canyon. You better find out what's happening on the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation because, and we don't have access to that, and you also should figure out what's happening on private land. So here's the map that I showed you before, just in the smaller version. Here's a map that Mark gave me some years ago, a screenshot of the Village Ecodynamics 2 project um, database, and you can see Mesa Verde down there at the bottom. These are the uh, sites that they investigated. There's some on Ute Mountain Ute land down there in the bottom in brown, but not very many. You can see pipelines, I guess, and roadways and things, and then areas of intensive investigation that Crow Canyon has done and others, but it's not, um, there are clearly, frankly, there's clearly systematic bias in the represent, representativeness of the sites in the region, even in this southwestern Colorado region. So just words of caution here. All right, we're going to very quickly go down to the Rio Grande region, another remarkable area um, of uh, archaeological research for a long, long time. Tree ring dating was applied there in the 1930s. It's still being applied. There's some folks doing great work down there. But here, very quickly, is just the date distribution. Uh, I'm sorry, here's our, our southwestern whole entire 19,000 data set date distribution with three sites from the Rio Grande region that I just want to emphasize here because they're well dated sites, right? By any stretch of the imagination, like San Canyon Pueblo. Pot Creek Pueblo has 353 dates between 1240 and 320, which is where that blue bar is on this, on this curve. Pueblo Largo has 279 dates between 1280 and 1440. Tierra's Pueblo has 265 dates from a 10-year period, right? Eureka, we know when Tierra's Pueblo was built, right? Because we've got 265 tree ring dates from right there, right then. The problem is most of those dates, a significant portion of these dates, come from the excavation of one or two structures. So the question becomes, how representative are those one or two exceedingly well-dated structures? How representative are they of what was going on at Tejeras Pueblo? And then how representative is Tejeras Pueblo of what was going on in the Rio Grande region? And I don't know. There are many archaeologists out there who are better at this than I am. All I can do is point out what I think are... Um, challenging points in the tree ring date distribution because these things are not uniformly distributed across space or through time. So we have to be aware of these systematic biases. So just to recap here, um, to come back to our, our friends with last names of B and the quotes that they had, Barry and Benson said, no reason to suspect systematic bias. 
Ah, uh, I disagree. Um, uh, they said large sample size lends confidence to the representatives of the date distribution. Robustness of the patterns are reassuring. Um, they're compelling. Certainly, they're compelling. Are they reassuring? And I would argue not. I would argue, and I have argued, and, I, and I'm doing it now, that these tree ring date distributions are actually full of systematic bias and that they're representative of scholarly history. The places that archaeologists went where tree ring dates, tree ring, where datable wood and charcoal was preserved. That's what we've got good records of. So rather than being reassuring, I find these um, these date distribution curves to be somewhat self-reinforcing. Um, and this is more outlined more concretely in the paper, but one of the things um, that, um, that people have argued with those peaks and valleys is that there's population. You see a peak in tree ring dates when population goes up, and then when people leave, the, um, the number of dates goes down, peak goes up, lots of people, peak goes down, no people. We have to be very careful when we make that argument. Because as you've seen from this database analysis here, the tree ring dates aren't representative of those entire 200 year periods of the Pecos classification, which is a specific classification that archeologists use. And it maps really well onto these date distribution curves. I do think there is something there. These dates are not meaningless. I just think that we need to be careful about how we, how we interpret these things. So the embarrassment of riches. That guy, Whitey Bulger, the, the bank robber, they asked him, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. So where, when, and why do we get tree ring dates at all? It's because tree ring dates come from sites where people use datable tree species in the past, where wood and charcoal are now preserved, and where archaeologists have done field work. We don't know where the sites that we haven't dug are going to date. We know generally because we can use ceramics and we use architectural features and so on to give them a, a bin that's not an annual year or a decade. Um, but we, we don't know in a 200 year period necessarily where they're going to lie. So we have to be careful. And if you guys ever watched Hill Street Blues, you might remember that guy because uh, at the end of the introduction to every show, he would just say, and let's be careful out there. So that's what I'm saying. I, I love the work that Barry and Benson and Basinski and others have done to try and make sense out of these date distribution curves but it makes me a little bit nervous for the reasons I've just outlined. So let's be careful out there. I'm happy to take questions if you have them. Thank you so much, Steve. That was really great. Um, I have a question that I'm going to read and then say what I think it's getting at. I'm not sure if it uh, does get at what the person who wrote it, uh, but it says my wife has done a lot of ecological climatological studies using tree rings and find substantial local variation in the width of tree rings and therefore climate interpretations. Do you have a similar problem in these two study sites? Um, so one thing, I, one thing I think this might allude to, I should let you answer that one too, but could you develop one master chart of the variation in tree ring width and would it work for the whole Southwest or do you have to develop those calibrations for smaller areas within the Southwest? The answer is yes and yes. When Andrew Ellicott Douglas um, developed the technique of tree ring dating in the, 19, um, in the early 1900s, the first three decades of the 1900s in the American Southwest, he created one chronology for the American Southwest. Um, and that was the one that he used to date archeological sites in 1929. Since then, we've got local chronologies for um, regions all over the American Southwest. And so ideally, you want to use the chronology that comes closest to the site that you're looking at, because you'll better understand variation. And with regard to, to the, the man's wife and the ecological studies, it is true there's a difference between precipitation in Cortez, Colorado, and precipitation in Denver, Colorado, or in the Front Range near me. Um, it is also true that we understand the differences in that in those precipitation regimes that we can have one sort of general curve for the entire American West, really, like Douglas Hemp was trying to cross state sequoias with with trees in the Southwest. But we can also develop exceedingly local chronologies. Um, uh, so, yeah, uh, there, the answer is yes to both. You can do the general, but you can also do the more specific and the more the better data are in the more specific. But the signals are generally good enough that you can have continental scale signals. Quite honestly. Thank you. Um, so I got a question about how uh, does the archaeological evidence from tree rings 
correspond to oral histories of indigenous peoples? <laughs> uh, that's such a good question. And that's the one that I need to go and, and, and dive into. There's, um, I haven't gotten there yet, um, but there's, there's a lot of work being done in Jemez, um, on the Jemez Plateau in New Mexico, working. So it's ethnologists, it's archaeologists, it's tree ring people, and it's indigenous scholars and elders and so on, working to understand the fire history of the area around Jemez Pueblo. And it's really, really fascinating what they have learned, what the scientists have learned about, about um, uh, indigenous fire practices and so on. Um, and I want to go and have those discussions, not about fire or about rain. I want to have the discussions about time. Um, and then if we can get at their notions of time through tree ring dates somehow, I would love to do it. But that is a project for another day. I haven't gotten to it. Um, but Mark, if you know anything from your work with the with the advisors down at Crow Canyon, I'd love to hear it. Uh, well, I I know that I'd like to sit in on that discussion with you. Well, maybe we should do it together because I'm not I I, I don't feel qualified to do it by myself. But let's do it. All right. Uh, so the Tim Kohler was on tonight, and Tim asked Steve, Steve, the Basinski et al. paper included an exercise where instead of counting tree ring dates, they counted cells of a little under a square kilometer that had dates. Yes. And they got a very similar distribution to the one created just by looking at frequencies of tree ring dates. Do you think that even with this coarse graining, we still have a biased sample? I do, but I want to sit down and talk to you guys about it because the Basinski, and hello, Tim, and thank you for joining. It's great to, to hear you have you on here. Um, I do think we still have a bias sample, and I think that there are problems with the Monte Carlo simulation that was in that paper. And, and I've talked to Dave Miko at the Tree Ring Lab, who knows I can barely say Monte Carlo simulation, much less understand exactly how it works. Dave Miko does it for other kinds of tree ring um, um, uh, applications, and he thinks there are problems as well. And we just need uh, you know to sit down and talk about some of these kinds of things. Because again, by no means do I want to throw the baby out with the bathwater on this kind of stuff. I just want us to proceed cautiously. Uh, so let's get together and, and post pandemic, and we'll have that that discussion. Okay, got a question from somebody who might know you because they say, "Hi, Steve. Great talk as always. I'm curious about what brought you to this project and what was." it that led you to see the need for understanding and reinterpretation of the discussions uh, that we have with those dates? Uh, that's a, uh, I love that question. Thank you for asking it. Um, what brought me to this? I, I love archaeology. I'm not a good field archaeologist. Um, I love the history of museums. I love what I call the epic sweep of humanity, which is human beings doing what they do, doing it well, doing it um, to satisfy heart and mind. And I, I was at the Tree Ring Laboratory in the 90s looking for a dissertation project and was doing work in the archives and so on. And I realized that people had not really documented how tree ring dating developed, number one, but then how it was applied, number two. So I went into the archives and looked at all of the correspondence. And I could do this because this was all done in an era when people were still writing letters. This had been done when phones were preeminent it wouldn't have been possible, much less email, which would have been worse. But um, when people were still writing letters, so there's this rich correspondence database of smart, interesting, fascinating archaeologists trying to make sense out of this archaeological record when they had no sense of time with which to work. And we all say, well, you know, time is, is you know, that's the essence of archaeology. That's what we give to the social sciences. But then you start looking around the Southwest and how much fun field work is and how risky it can be and so on. There's just so many cool stories. And I'll share with you one that is the only practical thing I learned in my dissertation. And Earl Morris and Emil Howery were two of the preeminent archeologists in the Southwest. And they were both critical in the development of this science. They were driving it around in Red Rocks country in Northern Arizona in 1935, say. And Earl Morris had a really old um, Model A car and they blew a gasket. And Emil Howery got out and he went to try and figure out what was wrong and um, and couldn't figure out what to do. And Earl Morris looked at it and he said, Emil, do we have any bacon? And Emil said, yeah, we got a full slab of bacon in the back. And so Emil went and got the big slab of bacon, which was not pre-sliced. It was a big chunk of bacon. And Earl Morris cut a strip of bacon and then he put it in as an O-ring on the gasket. 
And they tootled that Model A all the way back to Chinle, Arizona, 50 miles on a piece of bacon to get it fixed. And once I heard that story about these characters, these, these scientists, these archaeologists, these anthropologists, these regular people doing this kind of work, I said, number one, I can get interested in that. But number two, this is they're on to something special out here in the American Southwest. And I wanted to be able to contribute to it in a way that makes people look at things just a little bit differently. So really, that's why I got into it. And I've been you know, lucky and privileged to, to be able to make a career out of this. Thanks for that, Steve. That's really great to hear. Well, Kyle Basinski's tuned in. Uh oh. You've been mentioning. <laughs> and he says, he asks from Facebook So, can you conceive of a method for integrating these demonstrably biased data that controls for the biases and also welcomes new, but also biased dates? Um, this is the discussion that, that I want to have with all of you folks at Crow Canyon because. I, I make a strident statement like saying the three well-dated kivas at San Canyon Pueblo, which are a component of only 10% of San Canyon Pueblo, I say we don't know how representative those three kivas really are of the site. Well, you guys might, right? And there are archaeologists who understand the, art, the dirt archaeology better than I do. Um, and, and Kyle, I wish I had a good answer for you, but it's going to take a mind like yours to figure that out. And then for me to, to sort of weigh in, uh, I don't think in those terms. I don't think quantitatively. I think historically, um, and, I, and I have the existential willies. I'm always worried about doing things, but especially with tree ring dates, because they're, they're deceptively good. And, and, we, and we get seduced. And so the, the chapter I'm publishing on this is the seductively large tree ring dates. We can get seduced. Uh, it's the It's the siren song of tree ring dates. And we just say, oh, these are fantastic data. Leave it at that. Uh, but let's have that discussion at some point. Well, here's a question that sort of relates to the complexity of um, interpreting tree ring dates. And uh, we know that we have colleagues that have really taken this on and dissertations and whatnot. But somebody asked, how much, is, how much of a factor is repurposed wood in the overall dating scheme? Uh, it's, it's a... It's a repurposed wood like reused wood in in um sites yeah, i think it's, so it's yes. an, yeah it's an issue and tree and archaeological tree ring dating folks not me but my colleagues our colleagues have studied this and reuse is an issue and you can find really cool examples at walt B. pueblo for instance up on uh hopi mesas where they sampled every piece of potentially datable wood at walt B. pueblo and you can find a room that's demonstrably made say in the 1960s with a piece of wood that was cut in the 1880s Um, and, and, but you need the archaeological context. You need to know where that was found. Because if you look at those dates, just in a date, tree ring date distribution, all you're going to see is the date and say, oh, that's a good date. It's not telling you what's happening behaviorally. So it, for me, it always comes back to the subsite contextual information. Was it found in a kiva? Was it found in a roof? That kind of thing. But it also comes back to who collected the sample and why were they digging that site? Because we saw what happened at Mesa Verde with the Weatherill Mesa project. I should note also one other vignette out of this that came out before tree ring dating was um, developed um, and came burst on the scene in 1929. There were, it's well documented that cowboys and archaeologists who were examining the cliff dwellings at Mesa Verde would take a beam out of a roof or out of a kiva and burn it in their campfire. And we're all aghast at that. And I was like, you know, I've spent some time tromping around Mesa Verde after a day's worth of field work with no Nalgene, no plastic no modern, you know, clothing and textiles and things like that. You're going to be pretty exhausted. You know, you need a fire. Eh, there's a beam right there. What, what's it going to hurt to take a beam out of, the, out of the roof and just burn it? So I don't cast too many aspersions at our predecessors, but we know for a fact that they burned uh, roof beams at Mesa Verde. And, you know, that biases our sample. It doesn't buy it much, but it, but it biases our sample. Um, I got a direct and straightforward question. Where are the samples stored? Uh, the Laboratory of Tree Ring Research at the University of Arizona at Tucson. So Andrew Ellicott Douglas um, founded the Tree Ring Laboratory in 1937. It sat beneath in rooms beneath the University of Arizona football stadium for the next seven decades. But in 2014, they opened a state-of-the-art Um, preservation facility and new office building. It is a spectacular building on the University of Arizona campus. You can get tours and that you can get um, uh, come go down there and learn about the history and so on. But the thing that terrifies me is that 
the, the storage rooms in the stadium at the U of A didn't have any fire control system whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the threat to science right there with all of these samples, it's not just the archaeological, it is everything, was in a place in an arid environment that had no fire control system in it for seven decades. And it's just, as a museum person, that is a terrifying notion. But they are well cared for in Tucson now. Um, I've got four questions left. It's five o'clock. I'm going to go ahead and ask all four and sure. wrap it up with those four. Yep. Um, I got um, I got a question that asks about the uh, chronology for Sunset uh, Crater vol eruption in Arizona, and is there any does tree ring dating help with that at all, or tree yes. ring analysis? Yes, tree ring analysis helps with the, the eruption of Sunset Crater, but it gets complicated. So in 1929, tree ring dating bursts on the scene. Within 19 by 1932, three different um, institutions in the American Southwest had their own tree ring dating laboratories because this was the next big thing. So the Museum of Northern Arizona opened a tree ring lab laboratory and John McGregor set out to date the eruption of Sunset Crater. That was his job, was to get a date on the eruption because they knew where the ash was on all the, on the archeological sites, but they didn't know when it was. Um, the Laboratory of Anthropology in um, Santa Fe opened up a tree ring dating laboratory because tree ring dating, Douglas's chronology didn't work east of the Continental Divide at that point. It's, it's a long, complicated story, but there were, when Douglas published dates in 1929 in National Geographic, there were dates for the Colorado Plateau and Chaco Canyon and other places. There was nothing for the Rio Grande. And so Sid Stallings' sole job was to go out and develop a tree ring chronology for that part of the world. And then there was an outfit called Gila Pueblo, which was a private archeological foundation, which also opened up a tree ring laboratory. And it went out to date other archeological sites around the Southwest. So in by the 19 by like 1936-37, John McGregor had developed a date for the eruption of Sunset Crater. But then since then, archaeologists in the last 20 years have questioned the date that he come up came up with. And he had said it was 1064, 1066, something like that. And then people have done more refined analyses recently um, and say I think they're saying that it should be 20 years later than that. It should be 1080s or something. And I can't remember why they want that date adjustment, but um, they I'm pretty sure it's been revised a little bit. And I could help you find the answers. If you email me at the museum, I can help you find those answers. Great, thank you. Uh, we got a question. Will you be able to do tree ring dating in the Ute Tribal Park? Um, there have been attempts to, tr to do tree ring dating uh, over on the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation. There was, you saw a cluster of sites in one of those graphs and that was, I think it's Johnson Canyon. And that was work done 50s, 60s, something like that. Um, I have not approached the Ute about this. Um, I don't know. We would have to ask. Um, but but you can look at that landform and you can look at the site distribution. And there's going to be a ton of datable sites, cliff dwellings and other sites in that land. And Jeff Dean, the, the sort of dean of southwestern tree ring dating, has told me he thinks that the sites actually further south than Mesa Verde proper are later than the ones further north. And I don't know. But that's a project for somebody else. I, I can't tackle that, but I would love to know. Well, I know a little bit about that because I've been working on projects in the tribal park with Jim Potter from Paleo West Archaeology and with the Ute Mountain Ute Tippo's office. And um, they the the most of the dates that come from there come from when they decided to open the tribal park. And they did sampling as a result of that. And that was sort of led by Dave Bretternetz. And I think his yeah. teenage son, Corey, was... Yeah one of the main people that pulled those dates together. And in fact, those cliff dwellings appear to be constructed earlier and abandoned earlier or depopulated earlier than the ones on Mesa Verde. So, oh. so I had it exactly, I had it exactly wrong. Rather, the other question of whether that would hold up to additional sampling, but that's, yeah. that's what it appears to, that's what it looks like now. Okay, yeah. we're down to two questions. Cool. Um, Charlie on Facebook said, how can we get a better handle on abandonment dates since with tree ring dates, we get construction dates um, and folks seldom use C14 except on really early dates yeah. in the Southwest. Well, ideally you do it through archaeomagnetic dating, but a lot of people don't think it works and, and it um, it's expensive and time consuming and all of that. But Eric Blinman um, down in, in uh, Santa Fe has been working on sort of resuscitating archaeomagnetic dating for sites right. in the Southwest. Um, yeah, but it, 
I would also comment that uh, the use of C14 dating is really growing since it has become uh, more precise and people are focusing on annuals and figuring right. out ways to make it as precise as it can be. So And with and with Bayesian analysis and all that. So yeah, that's a really good point. But th th there was a Mesa Verde post sent something out the other day in which they said Spruce Tree House was occupied from 1206 to 1280. And those, I'm sure, are the, just the tree ring dates that they have. So, you, so Charlie brings up a really good point. That's not the occupation time for, space, for Spruce Tree House. Yeah, it's just not. Yeah, we need one of those uh, specialists up there to weigh in on that one. Um, so, Gary on Facebook asks, so you've got this bias sample. What would it take for a non-biased uh, assessment, and is there a plan to achieve it? Well, uh, thank you for that. Uh, was it Larry? You said. Gary. Gary, thank you for asking that, because one of the funny things is that I spend a lot of my time railing about archaeology. Archaeology is not randomly distributed on the landscape, and it's not randomly distributed through time, and we all know that. But there was a time in archaeology when we all went to, we've got to have statistical sophistication and random sampling and all of that, and it created a heck of a mess in the 1960s for otherwise what would have been good archaeology went into the sampling strategy where you had to find the, the random. Um, I, I'm not, I mean, you, where you had to find, where you had to create a random sample in order to have something that was reliable. And it was just stupid because the, the you know, the, the sampling universe is not randomly distributed. Thank Again, you. I don't, I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater on this one because there are a lot of smart archaeologists who have spent time with these dates. Um, I think if I had unlimited supplies of money um, and time, I think we could target, uh, I don't know, I'm going to have to think about that one. Let me ask a follow-up question, and then we're going to bring it to a close. Yeah. To what degree do you think CRM archaeology, where the sample of sites is drawn from the, the, the layout of a pipeline or the irrigation canals that came off McPhee Reservoir, to what degree has CRM archaeology created a more unbiased sample? Well, and, I, and that's a good question and a really good point. And I think in that, in that map that I showed that you had given me of the sites that, vi that were in the Village Ecodynamics Project 2 database, you can see some of those things. And I think it probably does make it more representative, um, but I don't know how and I wouldn't hazard a guess. Um, but I, I, I'm looking forward to, I'm gonna go to the Tree Ring Lab at, in, um, over Christmas and spend time doing the same thing I've done with this database, but for Chaco Canyon and Northeastern Arizona. Um, and look at what's happened in those parts of the world. And so we'll get, so uh, Mike Berry's database is now 29,000 dates or something like that. I'm going to re replicate his database, but with the subsite provenience information, number one, and number two, with the history of archaeology, when and where, I mean, who collected those samples, why and when. And once we have those two understandings, we'll have another big chunk of tree ring dates and data sets. And then I'm not going to suggest that I have an answer for that. And this is, I don't like presenting a paper, presenting a, doing a presentation in which all I do is criticize others. That's not my intent. This is a big problem. This is a big issue for us. And it's a huge opportunity for us. And that's what I want to emphasize. This is where it's fun, I think. Um, and so, again, we don't throw the baby out the bathwater, but we do be careful out there. Yeah, and I think something we is a topic for another webinar is the degree to which our dating of sites and regions um, goes beyond tree ring dating, and yet the way that tree ring dating anchors the dating of sites without tree ring dates. Or yeah. at a place like San Canyon Pueblo, the dating of context beyond the three kivas that have the most dates. The tree ring dates have been, have been used to develop a pretty, um, a pretty good understanding of how the rest of the material culture changes over time. Right. And use that in conjunction with the tree ring dates to right. address some of the issues that you've raised. Yep, it's an iterative process. I should note also that Pat Gilman and Roger Anion and Miles Miller and others right. got a bunch of folks together, including me, to talk about the chronology of the Mimbres Mogollon down in southwestern uh, New Mexico. And we compiled all of the available dates, radiocarbon, archaeomag, tree ring, whatever else we had, and then did a sophisticated analysis of um, of the dates in the context using Bayesian and other kinds of analyses. And the good news is, is that the phase designations that our predecessors had put together 
didn't get changed by much. I mean, the general gist of what we had put together doesn't shift too much. There were some indica- some places in there where you know a, a phase boundary had to change by 30 or 40 years, but it's not 200, and it's not that the sequence was totally wrong. And I think having somebody like Miles Miller looking at you know the the CRM and tree ring and other kinds of dates, we do the same thing for your part of the world, for Crow Canyon's part of the world that Miles and Pat and Roger did with that group. And that could be a really fascinating thing because then that's using a really um, a, a, a robust series of techniques that all have their own limitations, but coming together and, and finding out what the, what it actually means. And it's ultimately, it was also, it's redeeming that the predecessor archeologists didn't get it wrong. So the Pecos classification isn't going away. That isn't wrong, but we can refine it. Right. Well, Steve, thanks for the lively presentation and the lively discussion. Um, we've still got over 100 people that hung on. We lost a few of them, but uh, I really enjoyed it, and I learned a lot. Um, thank you. Uh, Crow Canyon thanks you. We Crow Canyon also thanks all of you who tuned in and who continue to support us during these difficult times. So we're really grateful for you uh, tuning into the webinars and for your continued support. Thanks, everybody. Tune in next Thursday. Yep.